Good afternoon and welcome to uh, Windsor Ready Talk. Uh, this is our March talk and we are going to be talking about um, staying safe at home and also how building your own community can help you. Uh, I am Diana Borges, the community leader for Windsor Cope, and that's Communities Organized for Prepare for Emergencies. Our speaker today is going to be who <laughs> <laughs> is part of the Cope Northern Sonoma County uh, organization, and we'll get into that a little bit. But she's also a uh, senior expert, so she, I will let her explain all that. Um, after Dawn is done talking, I will come back and I'll talk to you a little bit more about Windsor Cope. Great. Thanks, Diana. So, yeah, someone asked when I came in, was I wearing green for um, St. Patrick's Day? Mm -hmm. No, this is my Cope shirt. <laughs> But anyway, actually I got married on St. Patrick's Day, so my oh, wedding yeah. anniversary is coming up, so always good to look forward to that. Well, I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I appreciate the invitation, and I've been looking forward to you know, talking with you. Um, Diana asked me to tell you what a gerontologist is. I think it says that up there. Uh, gerontologists are simply uh, people who study the aging process and also who provide uh, services and various kinds of support to uh, older adults and their families. So um, I was at San Francisco State on the gerontology faculty for a while, and uh, then I moved to Arcata, to Humboldt um, a State University, now Cal Poly Humboldt. And then my husband and I moved uh, here to Sonoma County in 2006 uh, when I retired from uh, the Cal Poly State University. So uh, at that point, I also became the, um, the first executive director and then president of the National Association for Professional Gerontologists. And what we do is we credential the academic and practice backgrounds of people in the field of gerontology. Okay, so that's what I do other than, than COPE, which uh, Diana and I are both going to talk about uh, a little today. All right, so um, the topic is staying, trying to stay safe. Uh, and trying to build a community. And um, I'm going to talk about three topics uh, today. Um, the first is what to think about if you are contemplating a move. All right? um, the second is how to make your home safer, um, especially from falls, but not just falls. And third, uh, how neighbors uh, can be a resource uh, to help you stay safe and, and help you get along well in the community. Um, where we live, you know, tends to be really important to us, and the decision or consideration of whether to move or not is something that, that we all kind of struggle with from, from time to time, no matter how old we are. But certainly as we get older, the decision to move can be, um, can be a really important one. Our homes are important to us, where we live is important, it's usually where most of our stuff is located, right? So it, has resonance for us. It may be a place also where we have lived for a long time and where we have lots of family memories that are also uh, important. And um, oftentimes people uh, really do want to stay as long as they can in, in the homes that, that they live in. And we'll talk about that a little bit um, as well. But the question of whether to move or stay put where you are um, is, is an important thing. Um, I think we often don't think about the environments in which we live as interacting with us, but in fact they do. Um, we can influence our environment, but the environment also influences us, right? And it's been suggested, actually, that as people get older, the environment affects them even more than when they were younger. And, and I can see this, you know, in myself, and I suspect some, many, some of you um, as well, and that is, you know, I don't like to drive at night as much as I did at one time when it, you know, didn't bother me. Now, if after dark I need to go out to my mailbox, which is at the end of my cul-de-sac, I'm, I'm likely to take my, my iPhone and turn on the, uh, turn on the little flashlight, um, you know, app for that, whereas before I never bothered with that. So we do tend, I think, to be more, you know, more affected um, in, in, in good ways or bad ways by the environment um, in, in which we live as we become you know, more susceptible to its influence. So the environment isn't just an inert backdrop to our lives, it actually influences both our health, physical and, um, and emotional. All right, so I'm going to show you a picture now. 
So this is my house. This is a picture of my house. And you can see there's a stairway. Um, and it's probably way too steep to be in code. <laughs> it it uh, goes from our kitchen family room up to where you can see that little doorway up there where it's uh, blue. That's basically a kind of a storage loft that we use just to keep extra stuff. Uh, my husband had a, his painting studio up there for, for a while. But what I want you to focus on is I want you to focus on that little rectangle up there at the top very top, mm -hmm. near, near the ceiling. You see that? Mm -hmm. um, I, I, at one point I have, I don't, the laser pointer doesn't seem to work for that, but you, you, you see what I'm talking about, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, who, who knows what that is? Does anybody know what that is? That thing? In, intake for air. Yes, it's a furnace. It's a furnace filter, okay? <laughs> now, it turns out that this furnace filter thing, you know, the, the filter itself is behind this kind of screen door that has a couple of screws that you open it up, take out the old paper filter, cardboard paper, put in a new one, right? This has to be done a couple of times a year, turns out. Mm -hmm. And I cannot imagine a more inconvenient, less safe place to put this sucker, you know? I mean, who does that, right? Well, apparently the people who built our house <laughs> did that. And so it's always been inconvenient for my husband and me to you know, to, uh, <laughs> it's always been inconvenient to change this filter. My husband, who has Meniere's disease, which is an inner ear balance disorder, now uses a walker so he's safer. Well, you know, think about him on a walker, trying to stand up there uh, with me assisting, trying to change that filter, right? So what was once difficult is now impossible. I mean, there is no way that we are able to do this. The last time this filter was changed was when our daughter and son-in-law from Los Angeles visited us. <laughs> and I got my son-in-law up on a ladder on that landing to lead over, unscrew the screen door, put in the new filter, um, and, and screw it back together. Okay? So this is one of the reasons why people, no matter how much you like living where you are, you start to think about, well, you know, maybe a move wouldn't be such a bad idea. Maybe there's a different kind of environment that would be um, better, right? That wouldn't exert the kind of negative impact um, that, that that does. Okay, so um, there are a couple of things I want to talk about, um, about the uh, living environment. The first is, I alluded to it earlier, it's called aging in place, right? That's the phenomenon where people move to a certain area and they stay put um, for an assortment of reasons. They like what, where they live and so on. And even if you move to a retirement community, you can also age in place there. We've lived longer in our house here in, in Hillsburg, in Sonoma County, than I have lived anywhere else, right, as, as an adult. And aging in place um, often means that there will be concentrations of older adults in certain areas or neighborhoods, right? That can be in a city, um, or it can also be in a rural area. In rural areas, uh, lots of times, um, there's a phenomenon of a concentration of older people because the young folks have all moved out, right? They moved out to go to school, or they moved out for job opportunities, thus leaving older, a concentration of older adults um, in, that, in that area. That's not such a bad thing, actually, as it turns out. Gerontologists who study um, these particular things make the point that that neighborhoods or or communities that have high concentrations of older adults, people are often happier there, right, than they are in neighborhoods that are more mixed with people of you know of all ages. Uh, for one thing, it's easier to socialize with your neighbors, with whom you may have some things in common. Um, if you if you have a bunch of younger neighbors. Uh, they may stay up late, and they may be louder, <laughs> and do other things that you find, you know, irritating and, and annoying. And so, so it often is the case that it's it's not bad to be in neighborhoods with um, with concentrations of older people. That's one of the reasons, of course, that people often move to retirement communities. Um, there are several different kinds of retirement communities. Um, there are the retirement communities that are sort of you know, they just happen, right? I mean, there are no aging restrictions particularly. You don't have to be a certain age to live there. 
but these environments and communities have attracted people because they have attractive features, right? So maybe they have a great climate. Uh, maybe they have a lot of recreational um, opportunities. Maybe they have vineyards, and maybe they have wine, and maybe they have great restaurants. Um, I know that's what attracted my husband and me when we moved uh, to our house um, in, in 2006. So retirement communities uh, are also collections of older um, adults, and that can be good. But I want to bring to your attention an issue that I think we often don't consider enough when we think about moving, and whether it's a good idea to move from you know, one place to another, and that's an idea, the idea of person-environment congruence. And what that means is, is there a good fit, okay? A good fit between you and the environment that you live in. Now, if you think about this for a minute, I think you can imagine that if you have a high level of skills and abilities, and you have financial resources, and you know, everything is, is going well for you, you can pretty much live anywhere, right? And the environment is probably not going to have as much impact on you as it would have if you have fewer personal skills and resources. If, if for instance, your health is uh, declining, if you have mobility uh, impairments, if you have other things that make it more challenging for you, then an environment that doesn't require so much from you, right, an environment in which um, other people, for instance, uh, do more things for you, that that can be an environment that's more, you know, more conducive and better given your level and your uh, level of skills and abilities, okay? So, so that all makes sense, right? But think now about this, which I think is, is a little less perhaps intuitive and obvious, and that is for a person who has a high level of skills and abilities, if they live in an environment that doesn't have many demands, that where there aren't many challenges, where you have people doing everything for you, then what happens, right? Um, you know, think about that. You know, what happens is many people over time begin to lose the skills and the abilities that they came in with. I mean, it's like it's like exercising, right? I mean, if you know, you you have an exercise program, you go to a gym or you take walks in your neighborhood or what have you, if you don't do that for a while, right, then you begin to lose the ability over time to do that. And that's what happens sometimes when people relocate to an environment that isn't sufficiently challenging uh, for them if they still have a high level of, of skill. So I want to tell you about my, my high school friend, Jan. Jan and I uh, graduated from Wichita High School North, and uh, after high school we went our separate ways, but we kept in touch with one another. Uh, Jan uh, moved to Denver, Colorado. She went to college there, and then she stayed and she had a successful career as a marketing professional. She got married, she had a son, um, then she got a divorce, but she still had her son and she still had her, uh, her career. About I want to say maybe 10, 12 years ago, 10 years ago probably, um, she retired, right? Um, and she lived there still, you know, in Denver. It was all fine. But her son, a few years after that, found a new job, right? He got a new job in Portland, Oregon. And so he and his wife and their two or three kids moved to Portland. So Jan, you know, she's missing her family, right? And so because she wasn't working anymore, she said, you know, there's no reason I have to stay here in Denver. I like Portland. So she sold her house, moved to uh, Portland. Uh, when she got to Portland, she bought a condo, uh, nice building. Uh, it had lots of, you know, amenities. It was in a great neighborhood. She could go walking to, to coffee stores and, and other retail stores and restaurants and all that. So it was fine. But the problem is, she didn't have any friends, right? She had, like, no social life, zero. The problem, in that way, was in, in her building, most of the other folks who lived there were, like, considerably younger. They were up-and-coming professionals. Um, they had busy lives. 
Uh, some of them were singles, some were couples, there were a few families that had kids. There were like a couple of uh, residents who were older, but I don't know, for whatever reason, they didn't particularly hit it off. So Jan had no friends, right, in her, in her building. And so she started thinking that maybe it would be a good idea to move to a retirement community. Because then she thought, well, you know, there will be other people my age. She was attracted by some ads that said, come join our community of active seniors. You know, we have lots of things going on. And Jan thought, great, you know, this will work for me. So she sold her condo. She moved into this facility. She moved into independent living, of course. But it was also adjacent, and this, this facility had a large um, contingent of, of assisted living uh, residents as well. So when Jan moved in, um, unlike me, Jan likes to cook, right? And yet, she had no fully functioning kitchen. She didn't have an oven, for example. And one of the reasons is that the facility encouraged people to take their meals in this common you know, dining room, right? Okay, um, she didn't have to clean her apartment anymore because there was staff that came in, you know, to do that. Turns out she didn't have to do her laundry either because there were staff that, that took care of that. She still had a car, which she could drive, but the facility also provided transportation services for, for all of its residents. So, I don't know. I don't know if Jan made friends or not, but I have to tell you, I you know, worry about her well-being because even though in some ways this environment sounds like heaven, <laughs> right? It's like, yes, clean my house, cook my meals, you know, do my laundry. What's not to like about that? Except what happens is over time you begin to lose the ability to do those things. Right, on, on your own. So, so I worry, you know, because, because you don't want to be in an environment that encourages dependence, and I'm afraid that that's the kind of environment that she's now in. So I just want you, you know, to think about this idea of person-environment congruence. If you're thinking about a move, think about what your level of skill and what your resources are and what you can do. And make sure that you move into an environment that isn't, in a sense, overly accommodating where your skills might atrophy. But also make sure, if you need some help and assistance, that you move to a place where you receive you know, the adequate help that you need. So person-environment fit um, is a good thing to keep in mind. Okay? All right. So wherever you live, it's important and you'll want to obviously stay safe, right, in, in the environment that you live in. And staying safe uh, can have to do with preventing falls, but mm, there are other things as well, and I'll, I'll touch on some of those. So what causes older adults uh, to fall? There are a variety of things. Um, certainly medical conditions can, can cause people to fall. I mentioned my, my husband's, you know, balance disorder, his Meniere's disease. But there are other things um, as well. Um, there are things like diabetes and heart disease and other disorders that can make you more prone to falling. Um, some medications uh, can also contribute to falls. Some, some meds can, can be a problem because they like lower your blood pressure. So if you stand up you know, too quickly from a sitting position or a lying position, you can get lightheaded and dizzy and that can cause you to fall. Um, there are uh, age-related changes uh, that can happen that can make you more prone to falling. Um, for example, for example, we lose muscle mass, right, as we as we get older, and so less strength means that you're likely to have you know less balance. Uh, most of us, most of us have fallen, right, in, in our lives for one reason or another, um, and and often. You're about to fall, but you're able to catch yourself, right? I mean, you don't quite go all the way down in a heap. You can sort of right yourself before, before that happens. Well, a lot of the reason why you're able to do that is because of strength, right? Muscle mass, um, um, reflexes, reflexes. You're able to stop yourself and prevent yourself from falling. Those skills, however, those physical skills do tend to, to you know, atrophy um, as, as you get older. So. Those kinds of changes uh, can be an issue for a lot of people. Um, 
foot problems, uh, neuropathy, right? Um, can make it hard for people to know where their feet are, right, as they're, as they're walking. That can obviously <clears throat> contribute to falls. But so can wearing bad shoes. <laughs> and that is something you can control, okay? I mean, ladies, chuck those high heels, right? And, uh, and <laughs> shoes that have, you know, have backs on them or don't have a lot of support, uh, those can contribute to falling also. And you can do something uh, about that. Okay. So this is a handout that I uh, put uh, at your table, and uh, you can look at that as you know as I talk about it. It's kind of hard to see this, I think, uh, probably from where you are, uh, how easy it is to read. So I made this slide that summarizes um, all of all of those things. Um, find a good balance and exercise program. R remember, I said you know it's important to build strength um, and to keep your muscle mass from declining um, to the extent that you can. Uh, if you have a good exercise program, that can help. Um, if, if you have balance issues, physical therapists can be very helpful. I mean, my, certainly they've helped my husband with his, you know, balance problems. So get yourself into a good program. Uh, talk to your health care provider about your risks uh, for falling and have them uh, review your medications with you. Sometimes a medication you may be taking that could contribute to a fall could be substituted out for something else that would do the same thing but wouldn't have the kind of side effects that uh, can be a problem. Obviously you want to get your vision and your, your hearing um, tested. If you're not seeing well, then you may not be able to see and recognize hazards uh, in your environment. Um, and keep your home safe, right? Keep your home safe, eliminate hazards. I'm going to go over that a little more in a moment. But also talk to your family members, and that says all of that in the handout. And I added here, and your neighbors. Because your neighbors actually can also help you uh, to stay safe and kind of monitor you. And if they know you have mobility or balance issues, they can be, you know, a really helpful resource. Okay. This is the, uh, the second handout I gave you. Um, it basically says the same things, tips to prevent, prevent you from falling. Um, and that's, that's all good as well. Okay, so you can go through your house, basically, room by room, and, and spot things that you're thinking now, oh my gosh, look at that. <laughs> you know, I managed not to fall down in a big heap, but this is not a good thing, I should do something about that. This is an exercise I went through when my, you know, my husband first started having, you know, problems with falling. I would say, Look, look at that area rug, look at that throw a rug. Uh-oh, it's got to go. Uh, I have a, a friend and colleague who calls them, not throw rugs, but throw away rugs. <laughs> In other words, throw away, okay? Um, so, so there are a lot of things that you can do as you walk through your house uh, to see what you could intervene and, and make better. Um, Make sure that in terms of floors, uh, stairways, hallways, that your stairs have railings. Um, it's best if you have railings on both sides, but for heaven's sakes, at least have it on one for sure, and use them. And make sure they're, st they're sturdy and they're stable. If you're walking on stairs, make sure you can see the steps. You know, I mean, I've done this, we've all done this. I'm carrying something upstairs, up those <laughs> steep stairs I showed you. And, you know, I got my arms full, and I can't see the step in front of me, right? Well, this is not good, you know. You really want to try to avoid, avoid doing that. It's a good thing to have a light that's uh, shining both at the top of the stairs and also at the bottom of the stairs. Similarly, along a long hallway, you'd want to have lights, you know, at either end. Sometimes motion lights are a, a good thing, because darkness is your enemy, right? <laughs> if, if you can't see things that might be in your way, then obviously it, you're much more likely um, to experience a fall. So keep where you walk tidy, you know? Um, make sure that there isn't stuff, you know, in, in your way as, as, as you walk. Make sure that electrical cords are, are up against a wall, right? Or if they're out in the room, that you've got something over them so that you're not going to trip on them. Um, bedrooms, uh, 
the key here is to make sure you have accessible lighting lights, either a night light or a light by your bed that you can uh, turn on and off. Have a flashlight uh, by your bed. This is particularly important if, um, if there's a power outage, and those do happen around here, I'm told, from time to time, right? So make sure you have a flashlight. Uh, Diana, who knows everything there is to know about earthquakes, would tell you you need to have a good pair of shoes under, under your bed because if there is an earthquake, and there's broken glass, you don't want to be walking over glass with bare feet, right? You want to be able to put, put on a pair of shoes. Um, so those are all things that are good for, um, for the bedroom. Bathrooms, uh, you know, I don't have to tell you, right? Bathrooms are among the most hazardous places uh, in your home. It, it, and you don't have to be older. I mean, bathrooms are hazardous, you know, for younger folks because, you know, the, everything is like hard surfaces and and often, that often get wet, so they're slick, you know, and you can readily fall. Uh, but there are things you can do um, in, in your bathroom. There are non-skid mats and things that you can put on the floor that's likely to get wet. You want to have grab bars, okay, on either side of, of your shower, in and out, uh, um, near the tub as well. Uh, if you have grab bars by the toilet, that's really good too. And be sure you have a light on in there, you know, at night. I mean, I don't know about you, but I have been known to visit the bathroom in the, at, at night, right? Well, if there was no light in there, you know, that would not be good. I have a, a night light. So think about that or leaving a light on, whatever works for you. But make sure you're not going into, you know, a totally dark environment. Uh, the kitchen. Um, Again, I, I always think every kitchen is designed by some architect who's like six foot five, <laughs> you know? And that's not me, right? So I have all this storage space way up, you know? I mean, there's no way I can reach that. So, so of course, what you do is you try to put the things that you don't use that often, you know, up high, and the things that you're more likely to use on a daily basis, you know, your cookware and, you know, your utensils and so on. Keep them, you know, sort of like, you know, waist high, which for me may be a little lower <laughs> than it might be for some of you. But the key is accessibility, right? So that you're not climbing up on things all the time to, um, you know, to reach for stuff. They have great things. Now I have one of these um, in, in my house because we have, you know, sort of high ceilings. But you can get it at a hardware store, uh, little devices that will screw uh, light bulbs, you know, in and out so that you don't have to be climbing up on ladders and other things when a bulb burns out. Um, they have grabber things that you can also use uh, to get um, items, especially light items, you know, off of a shelf. Um, don't get up on a chair. Don't do that. Um, I've done that. I know you've all done that, but just don't do that anymore. Um, if you need to get up on something, use a good sturdy step stool. You know, I ordered a good one off of Amazon. And the key is to make sure it's sturdy and that it has, you know, a handle, a bar thing at the top so you can hang on to it. And I also try to avoid getting on that if my husband, even though he's on a walker, if he's standing next to me, it's better. All right? if, uh, if I lose my balance a little bit, it's good to have somebody, if someone is available, uh, to help you, uh, to help you stay uh, upright. Um, general, general household tips. Um, try not to have your furniture, you know, in an area where you're going to be walking all the time. It's easy just to sort of bump into something and trip a little bit, and that can throw you off balance, especially if you have any balance disorders. Um, it's good if your furniture is a, at a sort of a height where you can get into it and out of it without you know, a lot of difficulty, because a lot of times people get wobbly and experience, you know, sort of, the, you know, falling because they're trying to get up and down out of a chair or a sofa that's not at a very good height. So if you can deal with that, um, that's great. Um, you'll certainly want to keep, you know, a list of emergency phone numbers, you know, in your, in your house or, or at least have them on your, your smartphone. Um, and have a charge and have that phone with you. Um, that also is a good thing um, to, in, in an emergency. Um, in outdoor spaces, you also need to check to make sure you don't have things like broken steps coming up to your house. And that's good not only for you, but also for guests, you know, that you may have. Um, rails, hand, handrails are good leading up to um, your door. 
try to keep whatever outdoor areas, porches, um, patios, decks, and what have you fairly tidy again and clear from debris and other stuff that could uh, cause you potentially to fall. Um, I should have mentioned back in the general household tips, and I didn't say this, what, be careful about your pets. I mean, make sure you know where they are. I mean, I can't tell you the number of times that people trip and slip because, you know, Fluffy has run in front of them. I had a, a friend a friend who broke her ankle in like four places because she was coming down the stairs and her, she had two little dogs and her dogs got on the stairs and were sort of tumbling around and, and she, in order to avoid stepping on her dog, <laughs> right, she <laughs> hit a step the wrong way and, you know, tumbled and, as I say, broke her ankle in several places. So make sure you know where Fido is um, if, you're, if you're walking around. Um, also, um, outdoors, you can buy strips that can keep you from perhaps slipping in areas that, are, that tend to get wet and slick. Uh, there's outdoor lighting that you can, can get, again, to make that a safer environment. Um, if you go out um, at night, be sure you leave your porch light on, right? So that when you come home, it's not, you know, dark when, uh, when, when you hit your door. Okay. So this is like the last, you know, section of, of the talk that I uh, want to share with you, and that's uh, neighborhoods and, and neighbors can be a real resource for you uh, to stay safe and to, you know, experience a good quality of life. Now, one of the first things that, that we can say is that neighbors are part of your informal support network, uh, along with friends and, fam <coughs> friends and family. The thing is, is that we turn to neighbors and friends and family for somewhat different things. One of the things that neighbors do, better than almost anything, is they do monitoring, all right? So your neighbors, they're there, right? And they see you come and going, don't they? And if they don't see you for a while, they may become concerned, and they may check on you, and that can be a very good thing. Last week, I got a text message from my neighbor, Sharon. And Sharon said, you know, I haven't seen you out and about for a while. Are you okay? You know, you doing all right? And I texted her back and I said, I'm fine. Uh, I haven't been out walking because it's been raining and I rejoined a gym. So I've been at the gym on a treadmill where it's dry, right, doing, doing walking, but I'm fine. Thing is, is if she hadn't heard from me, right, she would have checked up on me. I mean, she would have come over to the house or she would have called or she would have tried to get a hold of other um, people. And this is one of the areas in which, and you know, Diana may talk about this a little more, about COPE, that COPE does in that I have like emergency phone numbers for everybody who's my neighbor, right? So I know not only what their cell phone numbers are and how to reach them, but often I know how to reach a family member. So if, you know, if one of your neighbors, you haven't seen hide your hair of them for uh, a, a period of time, Obviously, you'll want to check with them first, but if you, if you can't get a hold of them and don't know what's going on, then there are other people that you can check to make sure, um, to make sure they're okay. Another thing that neighbors can do is that they can provide assistance when you have an imminent household need, all right? So maybe next time I'm wanting to change that furnace filter, you know, I might check with one of my tall neighbors, <laughs> you know, to see if I can uh, have, uh, have uh, someone come and, and give us a hand with that and not just wait until our family arrives from, uh, from Los Angeles. Um, let me tell you a story about, about how this can work. Um, the first house I owned uh, was in, in Lawrence, Kansas, and I came home, I came home from work one day, it was a drizzly, icky day, and I came in, I changed clothes, and I went out, turned the light on on my porch, I went out to get the mail. When I opened the door, this bird flew into my house, right? I thought, oh, God, <laughs> what am I going to do about this? So, you know, I called the SPCA, the Humane Society, whoever I could think of, and, and I said, I this bird, you know, could you come? You know, they, no, no, we don't do that, but we'll tell you what you can do. So here's a tip if this ever happens to you. Here's what you do, right? What you do is 
you turn out all the lights inside, you turn on all the outside lights, and you open up all of your doors and windows, and then you try to shoo the little crib, you know, from, from your house into the outside. So I did all of that. The bird, when it came into my house, it alighted on uh, one of the blades of a ceiling fan, right? So there it was. So I knew that the minute I turned that fan on, that little sucker was going to go, Woo! And, and God knows where he was going to go. So I was worried because even though I had now all the doors and outside doors and windows and all that open, I also had an open doorway with no, you know, with no door from the family room into my dining room. And I thought, if this thing goes into the dining room, I mean, it's all over because there are no outside windows, there are no windows in there, there are no outside doors, and I don't know what I'm going to do, right? So I had a boyfriend uh, at the time, and he lived across town. Um, I had a mother also at the time. She lived in Wichita, right? So I thought, I need somebody to help me. What am I going to do? I thought, neighbor, right? So I went next door to my neighbor, Katie. I said, Katie, oh God, you've got to come over uh, to my house. You've got to help me. I've got this bird here, you know, and I'm afraid it's going to fly from the family room to the dining room. So I gave Katie a broom, right? And I told her, you stand in that doorway. Because the problem is, the problem is I couldn't do that and also turn the fan on because, you know, it was too far apart. So I had to have two people. So I got Katie with a broom in the doorway and literally, right, Katie barred the door, there she was, right, <laughs> with the room, and I said, okay, you know, whatever you do, you cannot let that little sucker pass you, right, she said, okay, I got it, right, so I went over to the switch for the fan, I said, oh, please, let this work, <laughs> I flipped the switch, the bird went, Bleh, right, <laughs> flew around for a while, and then mercifully flew out the sliding glass door, <laughs> you know, it was like, ah, thank God, but, this, none of that would have worked if it hadn't been, you know, for Katie, for my neighbor, right? So, someone to help you immediately, right there when you need someone, is something you can count on a neighbor for. And last, uh, but not least, is help during an emergency. And again, that's something that COPE uh, is really designed to do. And, you know, Diana will talk more about that. But let me just say, um, I'll give you an, an example. When I was a kid growing up, um, grew up in Wichita, Kansas, and we had lots of tornado warnings, you know, when I was young. And I remember spending lots of evenings and so on in the spring and the summer in the basement with my folks, the Cocker Spaniel, you know, <laughs> waiting for something to blow over. My mom would often go next door to Mrs. Lawson's house. Mrs. Lawson was our elderly next door neighbor and see if she wanted to come and hang out with us in our basement. And often she did. Now the thing is, is Mrs. Lawson had family in town, and she also had friends, but they didn't live next door, okay? And when you're worried about a tornado sweeping through and blowing you away, you do not have time to go very far. Next door is about all you're going to want to do. So having someone or some folks uh, in your neighborhood who are nearby makes a big difference. And that brings me to, uh, to COPE, which is I mean, we don't have here a lot of tornadoes, but we certainly have wildfire, and we have flood, and we have earthquakes and other things. And so the idea of neighbors helping neighbors in an emergency is really what COPE is all about. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, uh, Christina's putting my PowerPoint up. I want to tell you a little story that actually goes along with what Donna was saying about neighbors in uh, emergency and having the monitoring. Um, this year, my aunt actually passed away, but she had set up with her neighbor across the way, she was in her 80s, that they would open their um, drapes first thing in the morning. So that it was a signal to each other that they were okay. Um, that one morning, the neighbor uh, noticed it wasn't open, called another neighbor who had a key to her house, opened it up, and found out that she had passed away in bed at night, very peaceful. But if it wasn't for their notification system, you know, uh, it might have been a while before she was found. 
So that's you know a ex great example of the resources that our neighbors can be for us. Can I ask you a question? Yes, of course. Yeah. Uh, it's um, <coughs> slide forward, slide back. So uh, COPE, like I said, is Communities Organized to Prepare for Emergencies. The COPE program was actually started in Sonoma County in 2002 at Oakmont. And Windsor COPE is part of COPE Northern Sonoma County, which is a nonprofit organization. I will show you the, um, the area in a minute. Um, Windsor COPE started in 2020, and we are not part of any um, government agency, but we work very closely with the town of Windsor, Sonoma County Fire District, and uh, Windsor Police. Actually, the first year that Windsor COPE got organized um, the, with the town, all four of us put on three workshops, and we actually had in-person ones for like 80 to 90 people at them. Um, one of them was here, so I don't know if any of you attended the workshop out here on the patio back then. Um, so, Cope Northern Sonoma County, their, our mission is basically to help you be prepared. Be prepared so you know how to respond to emergencies and help each other. Uh, and, and the vision is that we can't do it alone. Our government agencies, first responders can't do it alone. We all need to do our part um, to be ready and to be there for each other. So this is the uh, organization for COPE Northern Sonoma County. The COPE leadership is that upper part. So uh, COPE Northern Sonoma County actually has a board and Donna is the secretary right now. I am a former board member and part of the board we meet um, board meets monthly but then we have monthly meetings for all the leadership and the leadership is um, that's just an example of some of the government agencies that are involved in it the you know um, fire districts and fire departments in the, the, the district um, law enforcement Sonoma County Department of Emergency Management. Actually, Nancy Brown, who's our SoCo Emergency Preparedness Manager, is on the board. So there's a collective of people, of organizations that are on there, like a halter project is part of that. Um, organizations, government agencies, first responders, but then us leaders, some of our community leaders, all the community leaders are actually part of that organization, the leadership team. So, from there, it goes down to the community leader, which, uh, like I said, I am the Windsor Cove community leader, and I'm looking for a co-leader. If anyone's interested, let me know. Um, because part of COPE is you don't have to do it alone. Every leader should have at least one leader to help you. So from the community leader, then, um, in Windsor, we have neighborhood leaders. And neighborhood leaders are like your block captains that you know we're familiar with. So you just oversee 10 to 20 houses. Um, you're like the liaison from me to your neighbor, passing down information, um, setting up meetings so you guys get to know each other and things like that. And it's only, uh, like I said, 10 to 20 houses. So Copeland and Sonoma County District, it's the same thing as the Supervisory Wars District, if you're familiar with that. It's from Largfield all the way up to the county line. And there are over 50 communities. Uh, I think we're at over 4,000 members also right now. So what the COPE program actually does, um, we help you get ready. We provide you with what you need. Um, so we do not do the work because the work is actually in the neighborhoods. That's where all the real work is. Um, the leader and the neighbors, the residents. Uh, because when an emergency occurs, um, you're there for each other. Uh, the first responders even say they can't do it all. Um, there's too many of us for them. Uh, during the 2017 fires, 
Um, it, it was a unique situation. Let's hope we never have anything like that again. But um, for them to respond to a 911 call was hours, and like close to like six hours, because you know just the the nature of the massive need of everyone. So we have to do our part and then be there for each other. Um, so prepare, educate, and assist. And how, what does that look like? We give you resources. We send information to you. We have a um, communication system that is, is group me. It's just a group messaging system. So cope leadership, um, all of us that are on there, um, there can be a message sent there, and then I, in turn, as a community leader, send that out to um, our community leaders, and then they, in turn, would send it out to the neighborhood leaders. So it's just kind of a pass down information, of information. And that system is used for um, emergencies, incidents. Uh, an example is, uh, there's a wildfire, sometimes Chief Turreville, who's the Northern Sonoma County Fire District uh, Chief, and he's also a uh, Cal Fire Battalion Chief, but Tur uh, Marshall sometimes is out on a fire, and he'll message uh, our group of uh, what's going on, and so that information can get passed down. Um, in addition to that, um, I, uh, I have an email list and I send out information, and um, because you've signed up, I'll, I'll put you on the email list. And I send out information of events that are happening or different things like, um, an example, Sonoma County Emergency Management recently recommended that um, for SoCo Alert, you put their contact in your phone. So when they phone that recent message, um, it doesn't come up as some random phone number and you don't answer it. It comes up as SoCo Alert. So those type of things, um, you know, it, it's just an, an information system. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, I'm already signed up for SoCo Alert and Nixle, which everyone should be. Um, you know, it's duplication. In case one method doesn't work, it's duplication. And you do find out different things. And you also find out a little different perspective on some things. You know, the go bags. Well, someone might have um, some little unique idea that you haven't heard about before. So it's being open for all the information, and being ready and being safe starts with being informed. Uh, I'll point out that uh, for the 2019 and 2020, uh, the COPE program was credited for um, helping save lives, especially out on Mill Creek, out in that area, um, when they had to evacuate. They were better prepared. They have been a COPE group out there, a community, for a long time. And they had, were better prepared. They had, um, had already set up um, additional evacuation routes, and that helped a lot. So the Cope neighborhoods, what does that look like? Uh, like I said, 10 to 20 houses right in your just immediate area of your neighbors. Um, and it's a way to build your community. The, the community neighborhoods that, that Donna was talking about, this is a way to do it. And, and you start by, the community leader would start by just going to your neighbors. Explaining the program, we have information that helps you. Explain the program, ask if they're interested in participating. And if so, you get their contact information. First step, you know, basics. Get the contact information so you can communicate with each other. Um, by doing so, creating a co-program you find out your local resources. So who in the neighborhood, do you have neighbors that are a nurse, a retired nurse? Um, who has generators? Who might have all these different th things that you might need? That's part of a survey that you eventually take to find out um, what information is in your area that you can use. But then you also find out um, if there are individuals in your area that might need extra help. You know, is there someone that has mobility mm -hmm. issues? So if they have to evacuate, could they need additional help? By doing this, um, you become more independent and more resilient. But you're also part of a bigger community because then you become part of that organization, right? You're part of this, this bigger community that you can ask help for. And also, by doing our part, we help first responders do their part. Um, their job, number one, is 
safety of us, right? So if we can help by being safe and doing what we need to do, uh, like evacuations, when we're told, um, then they can tend to taking care of the fire or whatever. But if they have to take care of us, come save us, then fighting the fire comes second. So there's those type of things that, that by doing our part. And the other thing is, which I kind of alluded to, you're not alone. You know, I know sometimes this thing's emergency preparedness seems really overwhelming. I've had, I've done it before. You know, I prepared the um, earthquake preparedness section of uh, one of our documents. And when I went into my garage, which I knew was a disaster waiting to, to uh, prepare it, I said, no, nope, and I walked out first time. It's like, I wasn't ready for that one. So it is overwhelming at times, but you do steps, baby steps, you know. And you, you look at what is your risk, what are the most important things, and you just work away at chills, you know, take chills at it. Um, these photos are, um, the one on the left is Karen Hancock, she's our fire district um, community uh, outreach person, um, officer charity coaches, Windsor Police. Um, over on the right is uh, a photo from last year's uh, Windsor's Pancake Breakfast and Safety Fair. And you can meet things like those situations. You can meet a lot of different people um, with similar interests and similar needs. And then the bottom was, this is the uh, 2020 talk that we had right out here. Resources. So there, we have a lot of different resources with the COPE program, and uh, these are, are digital on uh, the COPE Road in Sonoma County uh, website, but um, if you're interested in being a leader, anyone wants to be a leader, we have this handbook. It goes through step by step of what to do. There's seven suggested steps in here, but what I say is take this and make it work for you. Make it work for you and your neighborhood. Maybe you don't um, have to have all this, or maybe you're just not ready to do all this yet, but you start with um, getting to know your neighbors, getting the, the, the contact information and things like that. Um, so it's important to um, know what's going to work for you and your, your neighbors. You had mentioned that uh, a typical neighborhood leader would oversee 10 to 20 homes knowing that this process is overwhelming just for yourself, is there a method or an ability to modify the number of homes to keep it more smaller so that you can get through the process and then once you feel more secure and confident is build upon that with more homes? Would that still work for the model? Yes. So the, if you didn't hear the question basically is do you, do you have to start with 10 homes? No. You don't have to do anything. <laughs> this is just a guide, okay? If you want to start with two neighbors, go ahead and do that, and then build from there. Um, it's better to do something than nothing. Yeah. So the other, uh, one of the other main resources we have is this um, digest, which is also, it's, it's really about how to prepare for an emergency. It um, has a lot of good information in here as far as um, the basics, um, like how to start preparing for an earthquake, how to start preparing for the wildfire, for your go bags and shelter in place and those type of things. Um, and both of these, like I said, are on uh, the Cope, Cope Northern Sonoma County .org website. So um, the next two talks here, um, we have them every month just to, to help you for emergency programs, but also for life. The next talk is going to be April 9th, and that's when I'm going to do uh, emergency preparedness for earthquakes. So I, I am a geologist, so I will go over um, the faults in our area, what the risks are with those, but then also a lot of um, tips you can do for to help reduce risk to you and to uh, your property. Uh, 
And I have gone, like I said, I've gone through this. I've, I've gone through a lot of mine. I have took a lot of time trying to figure out what's going to work for me. Because if it doesn't work for me, I'm not going to use it. So I need to find what works for me. You know, I can, I can put um, earthquake proof on everything, but if I'm not going to lock those uh, cabinets back up, it's not going to do them any good. Uh, and then after that is going to be animal safety. Uh, Halter Project, Julie Atwood is going to come in and do a talk about um, emergency preparedness and response with your animals. Uh, North, North Bay Animal Services is going to talk after that. And they're going to talk about just everyday safety for your animals. So what do we do? We, how do we say, um, help them? Microchip, right? Um, certain things are not good for your animals. Um, we'll have them talk about uh, certain house plants that are not good, especially for cats. Some essential oils are not good for your, your pets. Uh, how do you find your pet if it gets lost? What do you do? So there'll be some, uh, it'll be emergency preparedness stuff, but then also just for everyday use. And then the other um, one coming up is the Fire and Earthquake Safety Expo, which I gave you guys all the handout. Um, Spanish is on the back. So the expo, this is our fourth year that we are putting the expo on. It's really a unique um, event. Uh, this year we've expanded and we are going to have both Henry One helicopter. He's going to, he, the crew, um, is going to do a long line rescue, which they have done every year. But this year we're adding Sonoma County uh, One helicopter, which might be doing a water bucket drop. We have a Firewise demo landscape going on. We have a uh, simulation rescue of an overturned bus with animal rescue, um, 75 exhibitors. Uh, so there's a lot of different things going on and hands-on information that you can learn and ask the experts on. That is on May 19th from 10 to 3 at Cloverdale Citrus Fair and there is a website you can check out with a video of a, a trailer. Uh, so with all this, what can you do? Um, like I said, I mean the whole thing here mostly is meet your neighbors. Work with your neighbors. Um, so the situation that I can come up with that really drills in how important your neighbors can be is a major earthquake. So we're all ready to evacuate, right? We have our go bags. Yeah, I know. I'm ready. But that's not the critical one. A major earthquake in our area is going to devastate potentially, okay, I'm not saying for sure, but potentially have, can devastate us in a matter of less than a minute. There's no warning, right? You've seen pictures of other areas, right, with complete devastation. Okay. That's when first responders are going to be overwhelmed. They can't get to us because of the need. But they're also, they may not be able to get to us, and we may not be able to get out because of the roads are blocked, right? Roads are blocked, roads are buckled. So that's why shelter in a place, they say, we need at least seven days supply. And that's when you're going to be needing help of your neighbors, but also check in with your neighbors. So our neighborhood, immediate neighborhood, is very critical uh, for those type of situations. Um, Northern Sonoma County and Windsor Cope, we both have um, newsletters that you can sign up for. Um, like I said, I'll automatically put you on this one. And we both have Facebook pages for those who do Facebook. Um, you can follow things. For Windsor Cope, I try to make it more focused on our area, uh, Windsor information. Um, and you can email me anytime, Windsor underscore Cope at yahoo.com. And then that's the Northern Sonoma County um, .org website. Um, but the COPE program doesn't work without a leader. I've had many people come up and say, I, I want to participate. There's not much I can do if there's no one in that area who will step up to take the lead, or two or three people, or just whatever. Um, there needs to be someone or some people 
who will take that responsibility to start it up. So if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to contact me. I, like I said, I have many things that can help you, and that's my role as the community leader, is to help you get ready for your neighbors. Um, before we take questions, I just want to go over a few things on your handouts that there. Um, on April 18th, uh, Sonoma County is having their shakeout. It's an annual shakeout that they do, and, and it's where you practice drop, cover, hold on. And uh, next month, we'll go over a little more of that in the uh, earthquake talk. Um, we also have from the town the preparedness pamphlet and know your zone. So it's critical if you're, you do absolutely nothing else, know your zone. Write it down. If you need help for that after, after this, stay here. We'll, we'll get that for you. And the other critical thing is have uh, be signed up for SoCo Alert and Nixon. So be informed of when an incident and also know if you need to evacuate are the most critical. Um, I gave you my business card. It has the, uh, my email on there. The other thing is the 211 cards. Um, so there's 911, which we all know that's you call for emergency. 211, you can call any time for information, a wide variety of information. And that's what this card um, gives you a little display of what. Um, and I do have a few magnets of, of that if someone wants. Uh, and I think. We are ready. Anyone have questions or comments you want to share? Yeah. Um, I know I saw the past where you were uh, having the free first stay and CPR classes. Yeah. Uh, are you guys going to have that again? I know they have them up at the Guidingville Farmhouse. Yeah. Um, the question is, are we doing a free uh, first aid CPR type of class? So uh, Windsor Cope and uh, Sonoma County Fire District, we put one on last year. Um, and I am talking to the fire district as part of the Windsor Cope, the Win uh, sorry, Windsor Ready monthly talks. Um, we might do one in October. So it would be, it won't be as big as that one, but it'll be at least the CPR. Yeah, because it'll only get an hour long. And also, are you, you said you had like a post meeting here. Are you going to have another one of those two things? Um, right now, all we are doing is these monthly meetings. Um, so we, um, Christina from the town, oh, actually, I want to introduce Christina Owens. So Christina is, has taken on the role of our town operations manager, but she's really our emergency preparedness manager, and she has become extremely proactive in helping us get better prepared. Um, so Christina and I talked about doing this instead. Um, so monthly talks here focus for the seniors and breaking down the topics a little more as opposed to doing you know, an hour or two hour talk where we give you ten different topics, right? So this is a little s smaller, easier digestible is the idea. But if you are interested in just having a conversation about Windsor Hope, we could be able to schedule a separate uh, meeting or an event or session just so that you get more familiar with the subject of, mm, I'm not too sure I want to do this or maybe I can participate, but I am super open to any suggestions moving forward. And I will be having um, a meeting, I haven't scheduled yet, for the neighborhood leaders. So anyone, if you're interested in maybe being a leader, you could come to that and, and talk with us. Just, just yeah. So, um, we live in Healdsburg, um, we're neighbors. Um, what, and it doesn't exist in our neighborhood right now, um, is the Cope Sonoma County website the best way to see where it might exist in different neighborhoods in Healdsburg? The yeah. SoCo Emergency website is the best, and we'll have that there. I'm not aware of one in Healdsburg, but if you, um, Nancy Brown at SoCo Emergency, um, would know, but their website does have, um, if you go into socoemergency.org, 
um, and wind your way. There is a neighborhood group category, and it does list the copes. There's also a map your neighborhood in like Sebastopol has a map your neighborhood, or no, they changed it. It's something else right now. Yeah, let me uh, let me add. You you also can go to uh, cope northern Sonoma County dot org. Okay, and I think there is there may be a um, I can't remember, it's been a while since I've been on the site, but it's possible that you can identify also from there um, uh, COPE groups. And there, and there are COPE groups in Hillsburg, by the way. I live in Hillsburg. I'm oh, in a COPE group. Say, right? I'm sorry, you said Hillsburg? Yes. She oh said, my God. Yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I was thinking Petaluma. I don't know. Why. <laughs> no, I went south. I went south. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, yeah, so, um, so do, do check that out. Uh, where do you live in Hillsburg? If I may um, ask. Uh, as you come into Healdsburg from the south over the bridge, yeah. the neighborhood right down that Kennedy Lane front street. Okay, okay. I don't know if there's a cope group right there, although there are. There is a cope group not far away. I think. I think the um, Rivers End, Rivers Bend, something like that. That's not yeah, too far yeah, from that. Those three. A anyway, like you know, don't take my word for it. Look up on the website. I think you'll you'll see uh, where where there are. And if you're interested. You know, in um, perhaps getting together with your neighbors and starting a group, just like Diana, Diana said, you know, there are people, me and other people who live in Hillsborough who are part of Coke groups, would be happy, you know, to give you a hand to get something set up and if you and your neighbors want to do that. Have you done presentation at the Hillsborough Senior Center? No. No. Okay. No. Um, to follow up on that now that my brain knows Hillsborough. <laughs> um, so anyone who's not in Windsor, you can also attend Northern Sonoma County COPE has a monthly talk, a Zoom that you can go on for people interested in getting, um, maybe becoming a leader. And that's on their website. If you go on the website, uh, I think it's on the home page, it actually talks about an, an intro session that you can sign up for. And there, they will go over that and then also um, answer any of your questions. Yeah. We do have a fireman that lives in our neighborhood, so that's helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he may be busy. Yeah. <laughs> well, when, <laughs> when, uh, when you need him. <laughs> but, um, yeah. You have a question first? No, okay. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, you mentioned go bags, and there's a lot of good resources out there for lists of what to go in your go bag, and that's fine. But what, one thing I almost never see is like a list, a time-dependent list of what you should do when you're leaving your house to shut your house down before you go out the door. And when we had to evacuate, uh, it was the Kincaid fire where everybody had to leave town, and luckily we had a lot of time. So my wife and I grabbed our go bags and we just left and yeah. we were gone for five days and we came back and the first thing happened when we walked in the door, it's like, what is that smell? Mm -hmm. It was the compost bin on the kitchen counter. Uh, yeah, right. So if it was to happen again, I would put that compost bin outside. Uh, the other thing was that was in the middle of the drought and I'm sure a lot of Along with us, a lot of other people were not flushing their toilets every time they used them, and so the toilets really stunk. Yeah. And so I ended up making a spreadsheet for, and it's a time dependent thing. You gotta leave right now, just go. You know, if you've got half an hour, if you've got an hour, et cetera, et cetera. And I keep that with the go bag, along with the time dependent list for the go bag, because you may have to get out of the house in two minutes, you grab what you have and you go, mm -hmm. but if you have, what did we have, four hours when we had to evacuate that time, there's other things that you'd want to bring along if you have more time that you normally would keep them to go back. Yeah, so I yeah that's I, great. I, I mean, have that's some yeah. sheets and I keep them. Yeah. I have the same thing. I did bullets and it's on my refrigerator mm -hmm. of like, I won't use get out now. We can fill in the blank. Yeah. Um, and then the other, you know, ones because um, SoCo Emergency does have a list on there on their their website. Um, but like you said, it might be a little different for us, right? And I have exactly, you know, 
cats and their needs, what, what their list is. Although, I'll be t since um, 2017, I leave my cat supplies in my car, um, down at the bottom and in the, in the back, um, because it, I usually don't need that space. If I do, I take it out, which is rare, and then I just put it back in. Um, uh, so I, ha I do have that also, and I have it on my go bag, but um, they do have a list time-wise as far as suggestions of what to do, and it also will depend on why you're leaving. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, yeah. for fires, they want us, you know, don't keep your drapes closed, right? Because they can catch on fire. So there's those type of things. I think, I've, um, have any of you, or all of you perhaps, have you seen these um, evac packs, these evacuation packs that, that Sonoma County um, Emergency yeah. Management puts out, Nancy, Nancy's office? I think there's also a list in that, in those evac packs Can that you have, have my bag? you know, what you do, you know, if you have, you know, just as you were saying, if you have a couple of hours, you know, what do you do if you've got 20 minutes, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. And that can be really helpful because, you know, when you're in a stressful situation like that, I mean, who sits there and thinks, all right, I'm going to be calm. Now, what do I need to do here in the next, you know, <laughs> half an hour, right? So. So well, these are go bags. They actually have, they're tote go bags that, that so called emergency is given away now. Mm -hmm. They actually have English and Spanish, but they're, um, they're more of supplies for the bag. And uh, as a little, you know, promo, we're giving these away at the expo. So <laughs> come get it. You, you can get Come it. and get your bag. Yeah. Or even just, I put it on my calendar <laughs> because. I think I'm prepared, I've got it, it's in the trunk of my car, most of it. And then it's like, oh, that prescription, it, it's not going to be good anymore. So right, right. It's right. not just in the event, but it's keeping that preparation. Keeping it current, phase. exactly right. Yeah. The same um, thing. It's a lot, it's, it takes some work. And same thing with all your, your food supplies, you know, yeah. uh, in your go bag, your shelter in place, food supplies, prescriptions including your pet prescriptions will have to need um, updating. Um, it's all that type of a, a thing. And you, you know, whatever works for you, maybe it's the first of the year you go through things. Um, some people, they suggest, you know, when you change clocks. Mm -hmm. Which we just did. Yeah. <laughs> Missed that one. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So we will be here if you need to know, like I said, um, evacuation zone. Mm -hmm. Make sure you, you, you put them on your cards, put that on your refrigerator or in your go bag, somewhere really handy. Um, or if you need to sign up for alerts or you have any other questions, you know, all three of us will, will be here for a while. We did uh, give you a survey. If you could fill that out, we really would appreciate it. We do use that for um, our future talks. Any recommendations of how to change and improve, or even um, suggestions of what you want to know about. So thank you, everyone, for coming, and we hope to see you next month. Thank you.